Thanks very much, Derville, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, it's been a bit of a roller coaster today, uh, from hope to despair, and uh, I hope, or I, I hope and trust that I'm going to leave you uh, with hope at the end. Um, on behalf of ESB, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to be here today, for engaging in this uh, really critical and important conversation. There has been plenty of food for thought, uh, plenty of argu arguments for urgent action, um, and certainly in, um, I think, plenty of reasons to be hopeful. I'd like to thank Alex White and the team at the IIEA. It's always a pleasure for us to collaborate with the IIEA. They organize some tremendous uh, lectures and conferences, not just about energy, and they're uh, such a pl pleasure to work with such a professional team. So thanks to everybody involved with the IIEA and also with the ESB team for making this acceleration or this accelerate event a reality and a success today. Um, I'd particularly like to thank our exceptional lineup of speakers um, for sharing their time and their thoughtful in insights with us. I think you'll agree it was a truly uh, inspirational and uh, interesting and, and riveting uh, sessions today. And of course, I'd also like to thank our wonderful signers uh, who supported uh, the event this afternoon uh, and this morning, and to Derville, uh, who has ever kept the energy high and made sure that this was a conversation and made sure that the voice of your voice, the voice of the audience, um, was heard in those conversations as well. So, so thank you, Derville, and thank you maybe to our speakers and our signers as well. And as we wrap up the day's formal um, programme, I'd just like to share a few brief final thoughts on where we stand and maybe where we go from here. So firstly, just to take stock, and I think it's always worth taking a moment to reflect on just how far Ireland has come on our journey to net zero. And I'm not comparing this, Michael, with any other country. It's just comparing it with where we were back in 2005. And you can see that in less than 20 years, the carbon intensity of our electricity has more than halved. It's an incredible achievement. And it really gives me hope for what we can achieve in the future. And that's despite what Michael referred to as the challenge of our economic success. So it's despite significant economic growth, um, and it's because in the same period we've installed, uh, Ireland's renewable generation capacity has increased from about, well, less than one gigawatt to eight, uh, as we were talking about earlier on. Uh, we've gone from fewer than 400 EVs during that period being sold to almost 23,000 in 2023. And of course, given the government's policies on uh, electric heating and uh, housing standards, as our housing output grows, so do our carbon savings. And this is real, tangible progress. And when we reflect on what's been achieved, I think that there are really plenty of grounds for optimism. Of course, despite this tangible progress, the challenge ahead remains really significant and the clock is ticking. 2023, as you know, it was the hottest year on record. Just this week, the EU Climate Service and the World Meteorological Association reported that, e that Europe is warming at twice the rate of other continents. And earlier today, Olivia forced us to confront the scientific reality of a warming planet. But here's an example a little bit closer to home. So this is a graph that's been maintained by ESP's hydro team in Ballyshannon since the 1950s, since the installation of Kathleen's Falls and uh, our turbines. And, and actually, interestingly enough, I think this was the first uh, cross-border project of significance between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, but this graph shows the intensity of the rainfall arriving into the urn catchment. It's done on a 25-day rolling average inflow, and you can see how floods come and how floods abate. And what you can see, I hope, is that from 1950 through to the 1980s, this remained roughly stable. The inflows seldom peaked at more than 300 meters cubed per second. It's a lot of water, 300 meters cubed per second. But since 1980, those peaks have become far more frequent. And this is where my digital notes are letting me down, and I've skipped to another page. Um, but you can see that by the 2000s, those pe peaks were approaching 350 meters cubed a second, uh, the average inflow during our floods. And since 2010, you can see that the peaks have been climbing up towards 400 meters cubed a second. It's clear that we're running out of time. 
So uh, anybody who doesn't, uh, who hasn't familiar with hydro, more water doesn't necessarily mean more electricity for us. Many times it means that we're passing water around the generators so that we can safely uh, manage the dams and safely minimize flooding in the area. What it means is more droughts between those periods of floods, which means less generation. And it means more intense times for, uh, for farmers, obviously, for landowners. And it's not just the urn, it's all of the rivers in Ireland. It's quite clear that while we used to describe our climate targets as ambitious, achieving our targets now isn't ambitious, it's absolutely essential. But my concern is that right at the point, right at the point when we need to redouble our efforts, there are countervailing pressures emerging. And there are signs, if you listen carefully, that resolve could be beginning to waver uh, around the world. It's really understandable. We talked, one of the panels talked earlier on about the poly crisis that our leaders are navigating. Many unprecedented challenges facing them simultaneously. While inflation might be slowing, the economic pressures remain high, times remain challenging for our customers. The geopolitical landscape is unstable and as Barbara was pointing out earlier on, competitiveness is a real concern. And in the middle of this uncertainty and pressure, there really is a risk of losing sight of the overriding crisis and the overriding challenge of climate. We've already seen the pace of ambition being reduced in GB. With the European elections approaching, certainly I'm hearing people starting to push back against climate investment around the EU. And the risk is almost less the risk from climate deniers and climate skeptics, but as much coming from the pragmatists who are making nuanced arguments about, well, you know, we still need to keep going, but maybe just take our foot off the pedal a little bit, maybe we spend a little bit more money, maybe we push the timelines out, maybe we don't set our ambition that high. And I think it's really essential that we don't let that narrative take hold. It's not the time to press the pause button. We've got to keep our faith in this, we've got to hold our nerve, and we've got to accelerate our action to reach net zero. Of course, affordability is important. And people question whether we can afford to continue to invest in the transition. But you've seen some of the numbers earlier on, and you've seen the consequences of our failure to invest over the last number of years. Rather than asking whether we can afford to invest, I think we need to keep asking whether we can afford not to. And the answer is clear. We can't afford not to. The electricity sector is the essential energy of the green transition. At ESB, as you know, our commitment is to reach net zero by 2040, and that's what's driving us. We've recently launched a pathway report. You, you can get some limited copies outside on your way out, or there's a copy of the QR code or QR codes that sets out how we can get there and the support that we need uh, from everybody else. It presents our interim 2030 targets uh, for emission reduction and our plans to achieve them. And while Ireland has many of the technologies and the capacities and the capabilities already, including the wind resource that was highlighted by a young scientist back in 1979, it's clear that further innovation and further imagination is needed. And particularly, as Michael highlighted earlier on, we're going to need long-term, affordable long-term energy storage. That's going to be essential to complement Ireland's growing large-scale renewables. And we know that this is not something that any one country or any one company can achieve on its own. So it's great to see the entire ecosystem here today. It's great to hear people talking about working together. It's wonderful to hear from the minister and from the regulators about ensuring that we've got the right policy and the planning and the regulatory frameworks. It was really heartening. It's also heartening to hear the debate today about what's really important, which is continuing to engage and build public support so that together we can accelerate investment in the transition to a net zero future. So just to conclude, it's really important to remind ourselves how far we've come to the, uh, in the transition to clean electricity and in using that clean electricity to decarbonize heat and transport. And I think increasingly, while it's, it's been slower, there is a real opportunity to decarbonize heat. And admit, uh, in the middle of this perma uncertainty that seems to be setting the world at the moment, it's really essential not to lose sight of the overriding climate crisis that's already having real and devastating effects, which we see in a minor way even in, in our hydro system in Iran. 
While it's really understandable that some people think it's time to slow down or take a backward step, my belief is that that would be a false economy. Climate change isn't waiting for us here. So it's time to keep the faith, it's time to double down, it's time to further accelerate the transition through investing in and developing and connecting more renewables, through investing in system security, investing in people and the skills. And I was at something yesterday morning where we were talking about how can we get more young people and particularly young women coming into STEM and into the sort of skilled areas and wanting to train in the skilled areas so that they can work in whoops, our industry and provide the innovation and alternative thinking that we're going to need to crack these problems in the longer term. It's essential that we innovate now for long-term energy storage. We haven't got the answer there, but it's within reach, and we've got to keep working on that for the 2030s. And of course, we've got to keep supporting and engaging with customers and communities uh, to ensure that uh, we get their buy-in um, and support uh, for, uh, and really deliver for future generations by driving to net zero. And if I can maybe just finally bring it right back to the start of the day where we heard that really powerful and emotional poem from Ch Ch Chandrika about Turla Kale. And uh, apologies if, I, if I'm misquoting her slightly, but the lines that I took away from, uh, from that really powerful performance this morning was now, as we stand between the foothills and the summit of progress, it's vital to look ahead again and to accelerate. So thank you.